In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, Paul in verse 10 and verse 11 would write, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. The short phrase that we find there, we persuade men, contains a great number of valuable lessons. We looked last week at a couple of these words, we, and realizing thus that the gospel is in earthen vessels, as Paul put it in chapter 4 and verse 7. The gospel has been entrusted to man, to earthen vessels. Angels, the Holy Spirit, Christ, are not going to come and deliver that gospel message to the world. And thus the writers of the New Testament noted the human instrumentality in that chain of events that saves. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21 that after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And as he writes to the Romans, he would say that there would be the need for a preacher so that they could hear and believe, and thus be saved. Obey that gospel of peace. But then there's that word persuade. As many times uh, as we might like to be able to force people to obey the gospel and to do what is right, it doesn't work that way. Not even God, who rules this material world by force, He does not overrule man's free moral agency, his free choice. One of the great controversies through the history of uh, Christendom deals with the sovereignty of God and the free agency of man. And Calvinists got to the position where the sovereignty of God overruled the free agency of man so that man really did not have any free agency at all. God predetermined all of his actions and everything that man does. Or a milder form of Calvinism now just teaches that God predetermined the outcome. Uh, but he doesn't predetermine how men get to that outcome, and thus he predetermines their eternal salvation or damnation no matter what they do. Uh, no matter what they cho choose within their life, they're still going to be saved or they're going to be lost based upon what God decided. But in reality, God's sovereignty does not overrule man's freedom of choice. Man, or God, stands at the door of man's heart and knocks, as we see Jesus saying, I stand at the door and knock, if any man will hear my voice and open the door. I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me, Revelation 3 and verse 20. And so, the principles that the Bible sets forth is that God dealing with man upon the principle of man's ability to choose or to accept it. Uh, Joshua encouraged the people of his day, Joshua 24 and verse 15, to choose you this day whom you will serve. And Peter on the day of Pentecost, it says that he with many other words did testify and exhort saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, Acts 2 and verse 40. This persuasion that is done, though, is to bring men to Christ by teaching. 
And thus, Jesus would say in John 6 and verse 44, that no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And it, it, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. We have to hear, we have to learn, and that individual who learns comes unto Christ by the teaching that is done. It is that act of persuasion by teaching. To try to win people to Christ without the proper teaching is in reality not to win them to Christ at all. But then he says, we persuade men. We do not persuade God. God is that one who is supreme. The persuasive message is directed to man. It's sad that the religious world has basically tried to persuade and, yea, we might even say force God to accept what they teach. They teach a perverted salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord. Put your hand on the radio or on your heart and just say, Lord Jesus, I accept you in my heart. Well, that's not in the Bible, but they're going to force God to accept that type of salvation. They were saved by faith only or by grace only. And they're going to force God and try to persuade God to accept what they do. But the persuasive message is God teaching man, not man forcing God. And so in that sense, God is mindful of man. It's Hebrews, the second chapter, shows that God is interested in man. More so than all of the stars that shine, God has an interest in man. So much so that God, in order to get man to obey that gospel, to do what is right, gave his only begotten Son. John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Or as Paul puts it in Romans 5 and verse 8, but God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so in this saving message, it is a matter of reconciling man to God, not reconciling God to man. God never moved. God remains the same. He does not change. His essential nature does not change. Malachi 3 and verse 6, he says, For I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change, and that's dealing with his essential nature. Uh, some want to try it to take that passage out of its context and out of its meaning and give it an entirely different meaning that, for example, the Pentecostals will come along and say, God doesn't change, therefore He works miracles today. Well, it's an, it's an improper application of what Malachi was teaching. It's His nature that has not changed. If God doesn't change in those ways, then why aren't you still offering animal sacrifices? God authorized it. God commanded it. Why aren't you doing it? If God doesn't change, where's the Adam and Eves today that are created by God, full-grown, out of the dust of the earth? He did that. God doesn't change. Now then, why isn't He doing it today? You see... That's dealing with the nature of God Himself. His nature does not change. He might, his law that He gives to man might change. It has changed. The commands that He sets forth, but even in those principles that are behind that, 
The same thing or true, if you obey my will, you'll be saved. If you disobey, you'll be punished. James puts it much the same way in James 1 and verse 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father, writes, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. It doesn't matter how you look at God, in what way, He's not going to vary. His nature remains consistent. And so God did not change. God did not move. But man did. Yes, God created man in innocency. Placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and yet man is the one who committed sin. And man, by transgressing God's law, was punished. Thus, there was a need to reconcile man back to God. Thus, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, and we might add that when babies are born today, they're born in innocency. They're not born guilty of sin, as Calvinist would teach. They're born innocent, free of sin. And they grow, and as they grow, they reach that age of maturity where they know to choose the right and to skew evil. And they choose wrong. They are the ones who move away from God. And thus they need, and that's all men, need to be reconciled to God. And thus, St. Corinthians 5 and verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in, God, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. Let me just add here, we today are not ambassadors for Christ. None of us are. An ambassador for Christ is one who stands in, a, in an official capacity as a representative of God. We don't do that. The apostles were rec ambassadors, not man, not you and I today. They were the ambassadors of Christ. But that still principle, be ye reconciled to God. That's what the apostles were preaching. You need to be reconciled to God. We take the message which they preach. Man needs to be reconciled to God. It's the same message. Even though we are not ambassadors, they were. In Acts 26 chapter, Paul stands before Agrippa. And it says in, uh, that he that Agrippa, by what Paul had preached, said to Paul in verse 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul stood there in front of Agrippa. He persuaded Agrippa. He had the desire for Agrippa to be saved, to be reconciled to God, and Agrippa admitted, I'm almost to that point, but no, I'm not going to. And he rejected the teaching and the persuasion that Paul set forth before him. So we persuade men. Let's not try and get in the position of where we try to persuade God. But what did Paul persuade men to be? Well, the passage that we just read in Acts 26 and verse 28 answers it very clearly when Agrippa says to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That's what we are to persuade people to be, Christians. Paul, nor the Scriptures, tried to persuade men to join a denomination. You know, in the city of Corinth, and you might, even though these were not denominations, the principle still remains that some were calling themselves after Paul, some after Peter, some after Apollos, and 
Either some were saying, no, I reject all of those and I'm of Christ, or it could be that I uh, am a Christ, after Christ. Paul condemned them for such thinking. He wasn't interested in trying to convert someone to be a Paulite or a Peterite or any otherite. We should not try to persuade man to be a Church of Christite. We should not try to persuade man to be Campbellites, even though we're oftentimes accused of being Campbellites. Denominational world, taking the name from Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell. All of that was worthless. It was foolishness. In 1 Corinthians, and I mentioned uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 11 through verse 13, where Paul mentions this, I, it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them that are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on to say, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. He did baptize, and he recognized the importance of it. It's just that he did not personally baptize them. But they were baptized, if you look in Acts 18. But he condemned the divisiveness and the denominationalism that was taking place at Corinth. And he makes the point, I didn't, bap uh, I didn't baptize you in my name. I didn't die for you. Christ is the only one who did. Thus, be a Christian, and nothing more than a Christian, nothing less than a Christian. Be a Christian in everything that being a Christian actually means. It also includes, don't be a hyphenated Christian. That is, for example, you ask a Baptist, well, I'm Baptist, I... Are you a Christian? Well, I'm Baptist. I'm a Baptist Christian. Or Episcopalian. I'm an Episcopalian Christian. Or I'm a Catholic Christian. You have a hyphenated Christian. No. Why couldn't Paul, the people at Corinth said, Well, I'm a Paul Christian. Or I'm a Peter Christian. The same condemnation that Paul set forth in relationship to that would have taken care of any of the hyphenated type of Christians. The Bible only will make Christians only and the only Christians. That's a book that Thomas Warren wrote years ago in which he set forth that very basic premise. If you take the Bible only, it's going to make Christians only. It's not going to make a Baptist. It's not going to make an Episcopalian. It's not going to make a Roman Catholic. It's not going to make a Lutheran. It's not going to make anything other than a Christian. To be made one of these other things, you have to either add something to it or take something away from the Bible. The Bible only will make Christians only but it also will make the only Christians. I can't be a Christian without the Bible and without the teaching of the Bible. Thus, Paul persuaded them to be Christians. Nothing more than a Christian, nothing less than a Christian. To accept the Bible and the Bible only. But then we might ask, while Paul persuaded, and we persuade men, why did Paul persuade men? Well, we go back into this verse that we're using. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. 
because of the Lord's terror, we persuade men. That's an attribute of God that really is ignored nowadays. People rebel against it. You can't preach about that aspect. You only need to preach about the love of God and the grace of God and persuade people because of that. But Paul says, we persuade men because we know God's terror. In Romans 11th chapter and verse 22, he would say, uh, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. God is good and merciful when he can be. Now, when is that that he can be? When someone meets the qualifications that are set forth within the Scriptures, then God is good and he's gracious to them. We won't take the time, but look at St. Timothy, the second chapter, where Paul talks about there's salvation only in Christ Jesus, and the grace of God is found only in Christ Jesus. How do we get into Christ? Romans 6 and verse 3, and Galatians 3 and verse 27, we're baptized into Christ. That's where God's grace is. That's where salvation is. God can be good and gracious and merciful but only to those who obey His will. And He will be good and merciful to them. But on the other hand, God is severe when He has to be. This is seen throughout the Scriptures. Go back to the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of time. There's Adam and Eve, created good by God. Placed in that beautiful garden, there's God's goodness. He had prepared for a man this beautiful garden. Provided everything that man needed within that garden. And placed man in it. God's goodness. His mercy being extended to His creation. But... Man didn't remain faithful to what God said. He ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God said, do not eat of it. And as a result of man's sin, man was cast forth from the garden. And we see God's severity in relationship to man when, he is, when it is necessary. We see His goodness in the creation of the garden and providing for man everything that man needs. His severity in casting man from the garden and preventing them from coming back in. We see the same principle in relationship to the flood. There's God's goodness in informing Noah that there's going to come a flood. My spirit shall not always strive with men. There's going to be 120 years. And then destruction. Why? God's severity in destroying the world because of sin. Every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he was a righteous man. And God tells him, Build an ark. Get the animals in the ark. You and your family go in the ark. And we have God's goodness and God's mercy toward Noah and his family and saving them from the destruction that comes upon everyone else. That destruction because of of sin. And so we see the goodness of God with Noah and the severity of God in God's destroying the world. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see the same th- principle. Genesis the 18th and 19th chapter. Here's sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the 18th chapter in verse 25, Abraham asking an all-important question, Shall not the God of all the earth do right? Right? 
God, are you just? Are you going to do what is right? Well, the question was, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And so God said, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare the cities. 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. And they could not find 10 righteous souls in the city. But in spite of that, here's Lot and his family who were told his righteous soul was vexed day by day by the sin and the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. And so what did God do? God sends an angel. And the angel says, Come on, Lot, get your family and let's leave. God spared righteous Lot and rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. The righteousness of God, yes, is seen in both aspects. He is a righteous God. He is a just God. But His goodness is seen as He spares Lot and his family. His severity is seen in destroying the cities of of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. As children of Israel go into Egyptian bondage, they call unto God, Spare us from this. And God, so God sends Moses to deliver them out of Egyptian bondage. He saved the children of Israel... There's God's goodness in sending them a deliverer who delivered them from that bondage. But here's Pharaoh and the armies of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they brought ten plagues upon the Egyptians because of wickedness, because Pharaoh refused to submit to the will of God in letting the children of Israel leave. If he had done so, then they would have been spared those ten plagues. But he refused. And so what happens? The severity of God is seen in the ten plagues. As they get finally to leave, God persuades them to, the Egyptians to allow the Israelites to leave by the death of the firstborn. They go, and now then they're facing the Red Sea. God opens up the Red Sea, and they walk through on dry ground, God being gracious to the children of Israel. But the Egyptians following after go into the Red Sea, but then all of a sudden all of the waters come back and destroy the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 3 through chapter 15. In illustration after illustration, we see these same principles. The goodness of God, the severity of God. And Paul is saying, because of God's severity, because we know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, if we go back to verse 10 in our text. That severity of God is linked directly with the day of judgment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. There's the day of judgment in which we will stand before God, the judgment seat of Christ, and we will receive the things done in our body according to that which we've done, good or bad. We're going to stand before God in judgment. Now then, knowing the terror of the Lord, because the judgment day is coming, and we know God's terror. That's why we persuade men. 
when Paul stood before the governor Felix. It says in Acts 24 and verse 25, they reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Now notice that last thing. First, just mention righteousness. Felix was not a righteous individual. He was a wicked person. He lived an ungodly and immoral life. So he reasoned of righteousness. Temperance was self-control. Historically, temp- <laughs> Felix didn't have much self-control. He lacked it. And so righteousness, temperance. But then judgment to come. Felix, you're going to stand in judgment for those things that you do. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you need to know the terror of the Lord. What happens to Felix? Felix trembles. Paul's preaching scared him to death. But not scared him enough to obey the gospel. So he says, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. That person who has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is not living a faithful life as a Christian, needs to be scared to death. Because they're going to stand before Christ in judgment and they should know the terror of the Lord. And that's what Paul did in relationship to Felix. Even though we're being told nowadays, oh no, you can't preach that way. That's exactly what Paul did. That's exactly what Paul encourages us to do. Know the terror of the Lord. And based upon that terror, persuade people to obey the gospel. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 27 through verse 31, Hebrews writer would say, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment, and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despot unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. Again, the Lord shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What do we think the Hebrews writer meant by vengeance? What do we think he means by a fiery indignation? People need to know that. People need to understand that, yes, the Lord shall judge His people. And if you're found wanting, there's going to be God's vengeance coming upon you. There's going to be a fiery indignation. And so, yes, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You need to be scared to death if you're not a faithful Christian. Notice what Paul would write in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6 through verse 9. That seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation. American Standard, I think, uses the word affliction. To them that trouble you. Again, American Standard, I think, has afflict you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. 
when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. What is it? Abraham asked God, Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Paul's answer here, It is a righteous thing with God. To do what? To bring tribulation, to pay back tribulation or affliction to those who would trouble those who are Christians. To you who are troubled, he says, here's comfort (laughs) that you can have. Those who are faithful Christians, here's the comfort you can have. That on that day of judgment, when Christ shall come, he's going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels or his angels of power. He's going to come, how? In flaming fire taking vengeance upon those individuals because they do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're going to be punished with everlasting destruction, a destruction. And it's going to be everlasting. There's no escape from it. An everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We read in James 1 and verse 17 about God being unchangeable. It also says in that verse that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. God is the giver of that which is good. If they are taken away from the presence of the Lord, they're taken away from everything that is good. There will be no good in hell. There will be only torment and affliction and pain and anguish and torment. That's the only thing in hell. And it goes throughout all eternity. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we better start persuading men to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. passage that we've been studying on Sunday mornings St. Timothy, or Hebrews 2. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, there's the justice of God. Will God, the Lord of all, do right? Yes, He will and blessing those who are faithful, but also bringing persecution and affliction and pain and torment in an eternity of fire upon those individuals who reject Him. But if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect such great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. Knowing the terror of the Lord. Paul says we persuade men. Do we as Christians, knowing the terror of the Lord, persuade people to become a Christian and only a Christian. Not some hyphenated Christian that's not going to save anyone. Not trying to reconcile God to man and make and force God to be submissive to our desires, but humbly submitting ourselves to the will of God. Knowing the terror of the Lord. And realize, yes, also, the goodness of God. Paul would write in St. 
uh, in Romans uh, second chapter, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Look at God's terror upon those who fail to obey His will. And look at the goodness of God toward those who do. If you're not a Christian, obey the gospel this afternoon. If you have become a Christian, but you haven't lived the Christian life, you haven't really been everything that a Christian is supposed to be, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, why don't you escape the punishment that's going to come your way by repenting of your sins and letting us pray with you for the forgiveness of them? If we can help you in this matter, and why not come as we stand and